have come in attendance with us both by automobile and by internet. I pray, Father, the same etiquette for classroom study that we have in our church would be true for those who are home. There has to be a confession of known sin because carnal people can't study the Bible and get divine truth. They have to be spiritual. The identity of carnality is, conf is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins. It could be sins of the tongue or overt sins. They need to be confessed so that the Holy Spirit can teach us the truth of God's word. I pray, Father, for that today. According to the principle of 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How thankful we are for that extension of the work of Christ on the cross into the life of a believer, not for salvation, but for sanctification. And we're so thankful for that. I pray today, Father, as we come to this point in our service, the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God out of 1 Timothy 5, 1 and 2 about how to treat the elderly of the church. Pray for Gary today as he makes his travels into the Northwest camp. Give him boldness, give him courage, give him good health, give him words, Father, from the truth of the Word of God for young people's lives. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you'll have your Bibles open to 1 Timothy 5, 1 and 2, it's where we are. Paul opens the subject matter up of elderly in the fifth chapter. He has a great length of discussion on this subject. He talks about the elderly, and then he talks about some of the hardship of them, at widows and things of that nature, and the family's responsibility to the aged in the church, as well as the church's responsibility. Here's what Paul writes in the first two verses to exhort a young pastor how to treat the elderly in the church. First, he, he issues something that looks like a command, but it isn't. When he says, do not sharply rebuke, this is a subjunctive. Uh, and uh, the word not, of course, makes us don't do this. And the word here means to, to treat harshly by words. You'll see as he gets into this, don't treat them harshly with words. And he'll tell you why, and I'll explain that to you as we go on into our lesson. He says, do not sharply rebuke older men, press buteros. These are men up into age that the society classifies elderly. Okay? Now, Paul is going to give us some help on this that most of us understand is kind of a standard uh, for the post-Diluvian error. Uh, do not sharply rebuke an older man, but rather, and, and, and because this is not a command, the Allah used here is not adversative. It's alternative. There's a better choice. There's a better way to deal with them rather than uh, using sharp words that affect their spirit. Do not sharply rebuke an older person. And then he says, but rather, is a reason Allah is translated that way, appeal. Now we have an imperative. Now Paul commands him. It's a present active imperative, second person singular, speaking to the pastor of the elderly. But rather, appeal. Um, and I suppose we might say you have a more compassionate tack, you know, T-A-C-T, tack. Appeal, this is a word, parakaleo, which means to exhort, encourage. Uh, speak to lift their spirits up, not down. But rather appeal, now watch what he does. 
he brings it into a family idea. He says, appeal to them as you would a father. And then he says to the younger men as a brother. Then he goes to the older women as mothers and the younger women as sisters. And then he says, this is how you treat them all ages. But his subject is really on the elderly. Uh, but you treat everybody in this and you treat them as family, right? A father, mother, brother, that's family. And so, I know maybe he's saying, you, you know, I'm, I'm a little afraid. We're so disruptive in family life today. I'm almost hard to say that this is common sense, that you should treat other people the way you treat your own family. I'm afraid to use that comparison because people treat their own family so badly today. Uh, I get a lot of calls in. Uh, from that from that situation well here's what he says and here's the tagline that's important to us He's, he tells them I don't want you to do this I don't want you to treat them harshly I don't want you to speak to the people harshly and treat them harshly I want you to appeal to them as you would to members of your own family and then he says in all purity and that's a prepositional phrase and, and that's a kind of interesting the English actually this is the word Hagania, which comes from hagnos, which is the word for holy. But this is holiness in what Paul, and the reason the English translates this purity or chase, chase, you know. The reason, because this is the holiness of God in action. This, this is why it's purity. And in our lesson tonight, we'll show you that. This is just... This isn't positional. This is experiential holiness. This is not positional. It says, well, you know, I'm okay with God. Well, God says, I don't know. Let me see how you treat people. Uh, I mean, I know you are positionally, but I'm after experiential holiness. And so this word here uh, is chase. It's a behavioral word is what I'm saying. It's a behavioral word. It's the way I want you to treat them. Well, Notice our lesson today in our first hour. Uh, he appeals. When, when, I, when I went into ministry, when I went into pastoral ministry uh, up on Pine Mountain, I should have never been ordained to do a church. The Bible makes it very clear that a novice believer should never be a pastor of a church. I was, at, I was more than a novice believer. I was a newborn, but I was on so fire for God in my salvation that I guess I look like a good fit. Being anxious to teach, I was called, uh, quote, by that church to be their pastor. I had no mentoring in pastoring. I had no knowledge of it. Uh, you talk about green behind the ears, but God did something wonderful in my life as a good father. <laughs> he put me in a church with some of, the, some of the most mature, wonderful, elderly believers of God who I suppose didn't, didn't take but a moment in the pulpit to know well, this boy's got a lot of zeal with any knowledge. A lot of zeal, but no knowledge, and that was me. And that I was up there four years through my theology training, and they were wonderful. I, I, there's no better way to tell you that they were the most wonderful, gentle, nurturing group of people, men and women, and I had a congregation that was probably 60, 70% them, and then 30% younger. And, I mean, they just were wonderful. And so I have that kind of background. Um, when Paul says to how you treat the elderly, there's a real beneficial in it. And when the elderly take great responsibility in a church, their ministry is enormous. 
their ministry, their investment in my life is your benefit. Their investment in me is your benefit. And that's, I can't begin to tell you. And so when I read things like this, it has a, I get, I get into empathy in a passage like this because I've had such wonderful mentors of the aged, the elderly believers who were spiritually mature that just knew how to manage me and did it in a wonderful way. Now, I didn't mean all of them up there did. Mm -hmm. For some of them, I had to earn my pay. But for the great bulk of them, they just uh, kept, kept my zeal into bound, with some boundaries because I was wide open. And so this is a great passage. There is great ministry in the elderly, and we'll talk about that today. One of the discouraging things is to see people reach, reach a certain age and think they have a right to set and not be active for God. And I'm not, I'm not comfortable with that at any age. And so he, I wrote how he dealt, deal, deals, deals with this. Uh, this word purity is a key word. In this prepositional phrase in the end is a key because it tells Timothy how he wants him how, how this ministry to the elderly has to be conducted, it has to be conducted in a, a, an attitude, a grace orientation towards the elderly to make sure they're encouraged in great ministry. And I find that important. I, I've got a few points, five I guess, but if you hear my volume go up and down, I... I must have water on the ear, not the brain, but the ear, because I'm having trouble, I'm sound coming back to me, uh, last night ever after I took a shower. Uh, now, I know you'll give me a lot of suggestions, and if they work, I'm open to them, but if they don't work, don't give them to me. I don't need any more. Uh, in our lesson text, Paul warns Timothy against treating harshly the elderly of the church. He gives a negative and a positive. If you pay any attention to Paul, this is what he does. I love his attitude as a senior pastor. He, he's, he, 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 he tells them what not to do and then tells them, you know, it's easy to tell people what not to do. It's hard to, to and spend time with them and teach them how, how to do it and then be patient with them to get it done. Paul was one of those guys. I mean, he was quick to tell you, don't do that. But he was quick to tell you what to do and to show you and to nurture you in it. And th this is so typical, Paul, when he says, do not sharply rebuke. This word in the Greek language carries the idea of to strike upon or to wound their spirit because it's a behavioral idea. Then he encourages them. He says, but rather, and I explained that in the Greek, but rather but rather call upon or exhort or to lift up their spirits to remain faithful and to die in grace. That's Paul. And Paul is that guy in Timothy, isn't he? When he writes uh, 2 Timothy in his last will and tell testimony, he says, you fight the good fight until there's no fight left. And so this is so Paul. Uh, lift their spirit. Tell them to stay uh, remain faithful unto dying grace. It is interesting to me uh, because on um, Tuesday night right now we're doing a mini-series on employment. And it's always amazing to me the parables that Jesus taught that had so much employment in it, the doctrinal lessons he was teaching. And I find it interesting that there is a famous line that people quote all the time. And after a while, they forgot where it came from, you know, like we all do. You know, like, oh, I don't remember. Where, where did that come from? And, and here, here it is. You'll hear people, and there are a lot of great sermons on this, that in that end of time, when you stand before the Lord, you want to hear him say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Remember that? Do you know that that comes from a parable on employment? It's from a parable of employment. I wrote the parable down, uh, I categorized it. It's in Matthew 25, 14 through 30, 
which would be well worth your time to read, but it's an employment. It comes from an employment parable. And uh, Ed Jones, I guess Ed's not here. Thought I saw him. Oh, there's Ed Jones, sitting back there with the Baptist. No, I was just kidding you. I, I, I'm kidding you guys too. Uh, that's what you have to do when you make mistakes. You have to correct them right away. Uh, this uh, parable, Ed, is a financial investor parable. I wrote a note here, tell Ed Jones this is a parable for him. This well done thy good and faithful servant comes out of this parable where he says, you were faithful in a few things, I will put you in charge of many things, enter into the joy of your master. This idea is what Paul is after. Encourage the elderly in ministry. This, and listen, I'm going to tell you, at any age this is true. But it's true for the elderly because they spent too much time looking in the rear view mirror of their life and not enough forward. You listen to them talk and they talk about yesterday. They don't talk about tomorrow. That irritates the stew out of me. Because that's a person that's kind of reached a place where they want to coast. And this ain't the time to coast. You must always, at every age as a Christian, see the better years of your life in ministry ahead of you and never behind you. Your best years of ministry are always ahead of you if you're a spiritually growing, growing believer. They're not behind you. And when you keep talking about what's behind you and not what's ahead of you, you're in a coast place, and that's not a good place to be. It's not that well, well done, thy good and faithful servant. That's what Paul is after, in my opinion. The second thing I want to call your attention to is Paul commanded Timothy how to exhort the elderly. He tells him in all purity. This is stay grace-oriented in living a godly life for God. St stay grace-oriented in living for God. Your age has nothing to do with living for God. Age has got nothing to do with it. Maturity, what you believe, has everything to do with it. Not age. Not, listen, not age, not health. None of these things that are distracting to you have anything to do with it. Job proved that. Purity is described. Let me show you purity in the Word of God to help you. Purity described by Paul in 2 Corinthians 11.3 when he says, I'm afraid. Now, see, this is practical. He's gone to a practical thing and said, I think everybody knows the story of Adam and Eve. He said, I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds might be led astray, watch this now, from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. There's our word. See, this idea of purity, this idea of grace orientation of godly living till the end is a biblical concept. There's no period where you go like, well, I can go into coasting. You're on it. Listen, you run the race till it's over. That was Paul's attitude. You fight the good fight till there's no fight. You run the course till there's no course. Watch this now. I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve, your minds could be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion for Christ. This is true with every age. It is true until the day he calls you home. Then you will hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. It's how you close it out. It's not how you start the run. 
You've been watching the Olympics? You can have a great start. You don't get nothing unless you finish that. It's how you finish. It's not how you started the race. It's how you finish it. So you can see where Paul is with this idea. In James a 3, I don't know if that's right. Would somebody look and see if that's James 3, 1? There's just something in my heart uh, that just says, I don't know if that's James 3, 1. Well, anyhow, here's what I'm after. Is it? No. I'm after this. Wisdom from above is pure. It's probably, is it 1, 3? No. <laughs> what? 317? Yeah, 317. All right. I don't know. I didn't put that on your paper, did I? I put 3 1, didn't I? Okay. 317? All right. Let's make that correction on your paper. But here, here's what I'm after. I'm after the word pure again. I'm after the word purity. I'm after this word that Paul says, teach us this way. This is what I'm after. Wisdom from above. Now, we all know what that is. Would you agree? Wisdom from above? As divine viewpoint thinking, as new man divine viewpoint thinking, wisdom from above that's operational in my life. Wisdom from God that I bought into that's now active in my life. Wisdom from above that's now active below. Are you with me? All right, that's this important now. It's not just about having wisdom from above. It's having the wisdom from above actively changing my life and having this result. Wisdom from above, when it becomes active by faith in my life, Watch this. And he goes in order. He puts them in order. First, pure. Wisdom from above brought out by faith into the manifestation of my life in how I'm dealing with other people. Is first pure, then peaceful. See, he puts them in order. He puts, there are eight here, and he puts them in order, and the first of the order is this word pure. This is the word we're dealing with. First pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy, good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. This is the, these are eight signs of super grace or spiritual mature believer who has got the wisdom of God inside and their life is, is assimilating by faith it out into their life. This is walk by faith and not by sight. And this whole thing starts with this grace attitude of godly living. And it's true for every age. The third thing that Paul, he commands Timothy to treat the elderly of the church as personal family, as fathers and mothers. And he means to treat them based on what the word of God says, not in human opinion, all right? When he says, I want you to treat your fathers, I want you to treat the elderly in the church as your mothers and fathers, brothers and sister, it means that you're doing, you're doing it honorably by the, by the word of God, not by human standards. Are you with me? Because they're all over the place. And in the fifth chapter, he's going to talk about how to treat your family. But this is the church family. Treat the elderly of the church as a personal family, fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters. In our lesson text, Paul used the comparative particle, hos, translated as. Watch this now. This is important. It's a comparative particle. He uses it as fathers, as mothers, as brothers, as sisters. See it in your Bible? See that word as? Well, that becomes a marker one, two, three, four. He used as. It's the same. It is the same uh, comparative particle. In other words, treat these people like you do your own family in godliness. W from wisdom from above. Not, not from below. And so he outlines this. And you can see that it's a family. Father, mother, brother, sister, kin people. Every church-age believer is a member of the royal family of God in Christ. That's the reason he could do this. 
The moment you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. And once you believe that, and the gospel is the power of God to save you, Romans 1, 16, then Ephesians comes along and says, you've been saved by grace through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest these men should boast. This is what Paul is talking about. This is exactly what Paul is talking about. This is what Paul talked about in Ephesians 3.15 when he said, from whom every family, notice the word that is used there in the Greek language. Patria comes from the word pater. Patria is the lineage of a family that comes from a father. It's your family tree. It's your ancestry. It's your lineage. That's the word family that's used here. From whomever. In other words, listen, the greatest ministry you will ever have in your life, it will be the toughest one you'll ever have in your life, is your own people. I guess that sunk in long enough, didn't it? John 1.12. For as many as received him, that is, believe that he is Christ who has come and died for my sins, buried and raised. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Even to those who believe in his name. In his name is the concept in his person in the work of his person. The gospel is not something. It is about a person who came and died for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead. In Galatians 3.26, for you are all sons of God through faith. Faith always has to have a working object. What is the working object of salvation? Christ dies on a cross, buried and raised from the dead. We call it the gospel. We call it the gospel. The fourth thing that Paul would encourage us about the elderly is in Paul's discussion regarding the elderly church, he gave an idea of who should be considered elderly. I want you to listen. Part of this is age and part of it is sensualness. And I, I mean that in a good way, not a bad way. Okay? Okay? Paul writes in 1 Timothy 5.9, a widow is to be put on the list only if she is not less than 60 years of age. This gives us a clue to what Paul is talking about, the elderly, at the beginning of this chapter. Now we get an idea of what he means. What, what is his framework for elderly? Now, I know you don't want to hear this. And that's okay with me. You shouldn't want to hear the 60. At some point, 60 is a baby. Okay? Now, this gives us a clue that what he's talking about the elderly are those who are over 60. Okay? Another clue involving the elderly is getting married again or getting married for the first time. And he remarks in verse 11 of chapter 5, they still have sensual desires. Now that's hard for a 17-year-old boy to know, even think about his grandparents getting it on. Unless you, unless you live in our family. You see, age doesn't give a believer the right, listen to me now, to be pro, pro, promiscuity, to be promiscuous. Thank you. you can't, that's not good at any age. And I'll tell you, listening to the retirement homes,
Things are really happening out there. But Paul gives us another, another idea. But H has nothing to do with it. You read, you read 1 Corinthians 6, 18 through the 7th chapter, verse 2. H has nothing to do with it. You know, a lot of people say, well, I've been married. You know, I, I'm this, I'm that. I can, I can do this. Not, not according to the Word of God, you can't. Not according to the Word of God, you can't. So, he says, because of immoralities, each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. In 1 Corinthians 7, 9, Paul wrote, if they do not have self-control, get married. It's better to marry than to burn with passion. Nothing wrong with the elderly getting married. The question would be, why? You shouldn't get married there for money any more than you do at 16 or whatever age they get married in the South now. Point five. One of the goals of the Christian way of life is to reach and maintain super grace status unto dying grace. I'm going to tell you this is an absolute truth because I'm in this age group now. It's hard for me to believe. I look, look, until I look in a mirror and I go like, oh, wow. You look like your grandpa. Your greatest years of ministry can be in your grandparent years. I'm telling you. Any of the failures that you made for whatever reason can all be made up with grandkids because of your maturity. Because of your maturity. Every bit of it. Your investment in your grandchildren will pay dividends in the lineage, in your lineage. My grandfather has no idea the investment he made in my life, how it's paid dividends. You may never as a grandparent see your investment in your grandchildren because you won't live to see them be grandparents. But I promise you, if you invest in them from your age of maturity, if you invest in your grandchildren, you won't need to see it because it will be there. This concerned Paul when Paul talked about and this is true with all super grace people that had a chance to speak in the Old Testament or New Testament. They were concerned about the investment we make in the next generation. Sensible people do that, don't they? They don't just talk it. Every politician talks about it. None of them do it so that it's there. Well, we ought to take care of our next generation. $20 trillion worth of debt. There's a way to take care of them. You know, the proof's in the pudding on the way, you know. Your greatest years can be in this very age group as grandparents. Not only grandparenting your own children, but listen, grandparenting other children. I saw Mr. Farmer walk out up in his senior years into the youth camp. And I'm talking about little kids, uh, the uh, Crossroads camp. And he said, you know, I don't know if I'll be able to do with these kids, but he said, Ron, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go out there and be their grandpa. And I went, yeah, go out there and be their grandpa. How are you going to do it? He said, I'm going to go out there and be grandpa. I'm grandpa. I don't have to be grandpa. I've got a lot of years of experience. I'm going to go out there and be grandpa. I'm just going out there and love on him, sit down and talk with him, pick my teeth with a, a 
What do you pick your teeth with? Toothpick. <laughs> Apparently more than my ears hurt me. And you know what? If you was out there in, in these days with him, he had one whale of a ministry out there as grandpa. He was grandpa. Just went out there, loved on him, taught him, loved on him. And those kids would see him come, they'd just run and, uh, and grab his legs and it was the darndest thing. You think camp is for kids. Listen, listen, kids need grandparenting. There's a place for you at these places. There's ministry out there for you. Not to go out there and sit around and, and be critical. Go out there and love on these children. Go out there and love on them. If for no other reason, just go out there and spend a couple hours in free time and love on them. I mean, that's not too hard to do, is it? If it is, just take your dog with you. He will love on him if you won't, right? Just take your dog. This is a great time of great ministry with the next generation. I love this out of Proverbs 20, 29. The glory of young men is their strength. And I've got all those guys in my family right now. You know, they just believe they can lift cars and everything. You don't, you don't dare grab them anymore because they put you on the floor and hurt you. I've got those young guys. And they're every bit this, the glory of a young man is their strength. But listen, the honor of old men is their gray hair. You know what the writer means by that? Wisdom. Their wisdom. Now, whether or not the kids take it or not, you know, that's, that's ministry, isn't it? Wisdom. Moses' greatest ministry was between the ages of 80 and 120. hoo Got any guys want to sign up with me? His greatest years of ministry went, into, went in and led the children out of Israel, led them to the promised land. The rest of the first, the first two forties were preparing him for this great ministry. Paul's greatest ministry was the last 30 years of his life. His greatest ministries weren't the first 30. The first 30 he called rubbish. In Philippians, the third chapter, it was, it was his last 30 where he was on a dead run until he died. In Psalm 71, 18, even when I am old and gray, O God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation and your power to all who come to you. Look at that. I mean, at some point, you, you begin to focus on the importance of the second generation. You, you don't think so much about now. You think about where this is going. And certainly this is the age group that does that. Thinks about how well are my kids doing? How well are my grandchildren's doing? How well are my great-grandchildren, if you're lucky to have great-grandchildren, and still be there? These are your great legacy. This is your legacy. This is your legacy. It's your legacy. I love Psalms 92, 14, and 15. Scoot got me onto this verse in ministering with the elderly, which he's passionate about. They will still yield fruit in old age. They shall be full of sap and ever, evergreen, and very, very green, not ever, I don't know, it might be evergreen, to declare that the Lord is upright, he is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. When we read the birth story of Christ, we meet two, two in this elderly group that were having great ministry, Simeon and Anna, just enormous great ministries, still on fire for God, still looking for the Messiah to come, still faithful. 
Isaiah 46, 4 gives five promises to the elderly believer. Even in your old age, watch the I wills. I will be the same even to your grain years. I will bear you. I have done it and I will carry you. I will bear you. I will deliver you. Five great I wills of God to the elderly. Once you reach 60 years of age, your greatest years of ministry are before you and not behind you. If there's any message I could give you today, that's certainly the message from the scripture. No matter what you face in your elderly years, listen to Job. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will take his stand on earth, even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh, out of my flesh I will see God. Let me tell you, you will if you see him in the flesh no matter what the flesh is going through. There's the dynamics of God. Job, I know my Redeemer lives now and forevermore. That was great comfort to him. I want you to write a verse of Scripture down as I close my morning. This verse of Scripture is for you to look at. Because if the Lord is faithful and tarries, if you're faithful and tarry, you will need this verse of scripture. Second Corinthians, the fourth chapter, verses 16 through 18. Paul begins this scripture with, whatever you do in life, do not lose heart. Whatever you do in life, I don't care if it's your marriage, your family, your work, your health, your losses, Never lose heart. And then he goes on to describe getting older and how you're dealing with it. This is a great passage. And I encourage you to study it. You need to learn it so that you can help others in your age group with this. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful today for your love and mercy and grace. And I am encouraged, Father, to know that the greatest years of my ministry are ahead of me and not behind me. It is what behind me that propels me forward to do greater. It's, it's not what's behind me, it's what's ahead of me. What behind me has prepared me for what's ahead of me. That was true with everybody I've seen in the Old Testament in the New Testament. It was certainly true of Simeon and Anna. It's true of Paul, Moses. May we be that servant that's prepared to hear these words at the end of our life as we hear, have heard at different episodes in our life. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. It's not how much we've accomplished. It's how it's been done. Great ministry isn't what God's assigned us and we've been faithful with what's been given so that he is able to assign more. And when it's all done, he'll count it all up and he'll assign it to us in eternity for great ministry. At least that's what the parable said. And so we thank you for that, Father. As we take our offering today, I pray, Father, we'd be good stewards of it. People have given as unto the Lord. We need to be the same way in the way we distribute it for ministry in Jesus.